next speaker today, oh, thank you, is uh, Dr. Stephanie Engelstein, who is a professor of German studies at Duke University and works on a wide variety of topics relating to German ideals and, and romanticism, gender studies, critical theory, literal, uh, literary theory, as well as uh, scientific theory and practices in the 18th and 19th centuries and onwards, just to name a few subjects that she focuses on. Uh, Dr. Engelstein has written two monographs, Anxious Autonomy, Conception of the Human Form in Literary and Naturalist Discourse, published in 2008 with SUNY Press, and Sibling Action, The Genealogical Structure of Modernity, published in 2017 with Columbia Press and shortlisted for the Kenscher Prize, in which I believe the German translation has just come out, and there will be a book launch party for it here July 17th, open to the public, yes? Okay, so mark your calendars. Um, during this past year, Dr. Engelstein has been a visiting scholar at the Leibniz Center for Literary and Cultural Research in Berlin, during which time she has been working on two new books, The Opposite Sex and Reflections from Germany on Diversity and Violent Pasts, an essay in Six Cemeteries. This past year, her project for The Opposite Sex was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Fulbright Foundation, while well, this year it is being funded by a Guggenheim Fellowship. Today, however, Dr. Engelstein will be delivering to us lecture, Excitability, Love, and the Fortuity of Flaws in the Absolute, around 1800. Please, everyone, join me in giving a very warm welcome to our speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I want to also mention that um, I'll be speaking in English, but I am happy to accept questions in German afterwards. Um, and in addition to, uh, um, uh, to thanking Sarah for that introduction, I'd also like to give a, a special thanks to Patrick Iden Offen and to Thomas Karana for the invitation to present here today. Um, I actually want to mention briefly how that came about. Two weeks ago, when the original uh, announcement for the uh, conference went out, um, I was so enthusiastic about the topic that I spoke to Patrick, and um, he very kindly invited me to participate, um, uh, which was, uh, you know, uh, which was something I did not want to say no to uh, because the topic is something that I'm working on and close to my heart. In the intervening two weeks, I also spent seven of those days on a family vacation in uh, the Alps. So this talk is necessarily somewhat um, spontaneous. Uh, it is also um, speculative. I hope it will still be an interesting contribution. And I use the word interesting here uh, as a term of art because it is uh, one of the topics of the talk itself. Um, so the closed, the closed or totalizing or potentially totalitarian nature of absolute idealism and the question of whether avenues for receptivity can be found has been central to its reception for 75 years. The issue of receptivity cannot be separated from that of boundary, inside and outside, and relation. What I want to do today is to give a kind of tour through a number of thinkers on this dynamic on the boundary and its availability to permeation, beginning with the reception of the Scottish physician John Brown in Germany, touching briefly on Schelling, and then spending more time with Novalis and Gunderoda. I will also address, um, as Patrick did, the uh, article by Reinhold Goetz that we, was the spark for this conference, because it seemed to me to speak so directly to Novalis in particular. To frame this question of the boundary, the process the process of its establishment, its potential permeability, its vulnerability, and its policing, I suggest it would be productive to go back to the moment in 1794 and 1795 when a medical student in Germany named Andreas Hirschlaub simultaneously encountered Fichte's Wissenschaftslehrer and the work of the Scottish physician John Brown. Brown belongs to the background of enough of the idealists and romantics so that his name is familiar. But a look at Brown through the lens of Hirschlaub's interpretation provides a good starting point for thinking about receptivity and significantly linking the material in very concrete ways with the intellect. Brown's theory attributes to every living being a reservoir of it. No, it's okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I had it. Um, Brown's theory attributes to every living being a reservoir of excitability that is acted upon by stimulation and that instigates all living functions. Brown listed the functions of the living being as muscular contraction, sense, and the energy of the brain in thinking and in exciting passion. Oh, this time it is supposed to happen. Yeah, it doesn't work. Okay. Um, so Brown there, thereby both teases apart the dual system of Albrecht von Haller, which recognized only sensibility and irritability, and he also recombines the component parts. Oh, great. 
Thank you. Sensibility dissolves into the discrete properties of sense perception on the one hand and intellectual and emotional activity on the other. And both are united to the muscular activity that Haller had, la had labeled irritability. Moreover, all of these functions originate and are united into a nervous system composed of both nerves and muscles, which forms the seat of excitability. Excitability thus describes the entire feedback loop of receptivity, regulation, and response. It accepts as a stimulus not only clearly external incitements, but also the physically internal, as well as thoughts and passions, which are, if you remember, also among the living functions. So there's a, a loop here. There's a latent holism, in other words, that was part of its attraction for the absolute idealist. Another part of this attraction inheres in the fact that the degree of excitement for Brown is not a simple proportionate reaction to the strength of the sim stimulus. Rather, the level of available excitability can be suppressed by previous stimulation uh, or heightened by insufficient, uh, by insufficient previous stimulation. It is, in other words, the internal state of one's excitability that it determines the response to external prompts. Brown here establishes a relationship between the living being and the external world that extends from nourishment and breath to passion and emotion, excite, uh, locating temporal priority for activity outside the living being, but granting regulatory agency to the internal functioning of the being itself. The living being thus constitutes itself through, but also against, external provocation. The ability to do so is life, a, quote, forced state, unquote, as he famously declared. Brown had died in 1780 without his theories finding a toehold in Germany. Early readers interpreted his account as one of passive reactivity. But Rochlaub, under the influence of Fichte's Wissenschaftslehrer, reinterpreted Brown's claims as the foundation of a theory of the organism, a word nowhere used by Brown. For Rochlaub, the organism is that which instantiates itself, that is, which lives, insofar as its own impulses respond rather than merely reacting to the impressions of an outer world. In his Von dem Einfluss der Braunischen Theorie und der Praxische Heilkunde and his Untersuchungen über Pathogonie, both published in 1798, Rochlaub spells out a definition of life as dependent on an interplay of the internal and the external, which is first and foremost a property of each individual living being. The outer condition, or Organisation, is the structure of the body, its anatomy as well as the relationship of the parts to each other, their Zusammenhang. The inner condition is a principle of life, namely its excitability, which is a quality of its organismus. Right? So there's already an internal and external between the organization and the organismus of any given living being. Um, a second order of internal and external is then implicit to the system of stimulus and response. Insofar as the stimulus is external to the system by definition, passions, for example, are as external as a pinprick or cold. In other words, the very concepts of internal and external are relative. The living being can neither be equated with its anatomy nor its physiology, but represents a regulative disposition that interrupts an otherwise predictable and stable chain of cause and effect. If this is sounding familiar from Schelling, there's good reason for this, right? Um, as Rochlaub declares, Veränderung kann aber nicht entstehen, solange die Kräfte der einzelnen Grundstoffe ineinander mit gleichmäßiger Gewalt fortwirken. In other words, life only appears in deviation from smooth and immediate reactivity, which can be thought of as the indifference of non-living matter. We see examples of this principle in the fact that the organism reacts with decreasing intensity to a stimulating drug or spicy food over time, and then readjusts its, to its original degree of reactivity if a pause in the stimulus or incitement allows it to recover. Erregbarkeit differs from simple Reizbarkeit because of this Selbstwirksamkeit, its Vermögen selbst zu wirken, zu handeln. The ability to disrupt and redirect the series of causes and effects, what we have been referring to as spontaneity, is not a vitalistic force for Rochlaub, but rather the descriptive equivalent of life. Das Lebensprinzip müssen wir uns folglich als bloßes Vermögen der organischen Materie auf Eindrücke von außen entgegenzuwirken, vorstellen. Eventually, even the sober incitements of a well-regulated life will wear down the ability of, uh, to moderate responses. And once the organism's excitability is fully exhausted, it returns to indifference and life ends. The living being, however, mediates actively, causally, and self-directedly between external stimulus and living function. If, for Rochlaub, living organism offers resistance to mere stimulation of the outer world and can be defined by the sphere of this activity, Schelling, responding to Rochlaub, redefines this activity of resistance not as a mere property of the boundary between objects, but as its generator. Damit sie nicht assimiliert werde, muss sie assimilieren. Damit sie nicht organisiert werde, muss sie organisieren. In dieser Handlung der Entgegensetzung scheidet sich 
für sie Inneres von Äußerem. Ihre Empfänglichkeit für das Äußere ist also durch ihre Tätigkeit gegen dasselbe bedingt. Nur insofern sie der äußeren Natur widerstrebt, kann die äußere Natur auf sie, also auf ein Inneres, einwirken. At a minimal level, this resistance exists even for the inorganic world and explains how objects come to be in a world of becoming. The forces at work include repulsion and attraction, as well as chemical processes. Brown's and Hirschlaub's excitability, which unites receptivity with activity, thus migrates for Schelling from a principle of life to a function of the universal organism, the world soul. And of course, um, his first work on uh, Die Weltseele came out before he encountered Hirschlaub, but he um, encountered Hirschlaub's work immediately thereafter, and they became collaborators. He went to Bamberg to teach where Hirschlaub was for a semester. Um, as complexity increases, so does the cost of maintaining difference. If all boundaries already entail resistance against indifference as a condition of existence, this oppositional force must be still stronger for living beings. There is receptivity in this dynamic, Empfänglichkeit, an avenue for the outer to, to affect the inner, but only in ways not regulated, but only in ways regulated by the inner state, um, conditioned by a form of opposition and control. Already for Hirschlaub and Brown, uh, for Hirschlaub as for Brown, das Leben müssen wir uns also a priori as einen gezwungenen Zustand denken, one that exists only through its response to and against its surroundings. But Schelling is in dialogue here not only with Hirschlaub, but also with Karl Friedrich Kielmeier. In Kielmeier's transformationalist biology, defensive activity appears concretely as a struggle to preserve life against destructive depredations. Kielmeier's forces of destruction are not the inertia of inorganic indifference as Hirschlaub, but other living beings, such as predators, and other deadly external circumstances and situations. Schelling, who uh, is very clear about his debt to Kielmeier, um, brings Kielmeier's forces of destruction back to Hirschlaub's first principles and identifies them, and, excuse me, and, I, and intensifies them. Das Leben, wo es zustande kommt, kommt gleichsam wieder der Willen der äußeren Natur, durch ein Losreißen von ihr zustande. Die äußere Natur also wird gegen das Leben ankämpfen. Die meisten äußeren Einflüsse, die man für lebensbefördernd hält, sind eigentlich destruktiv für das Leben. The centrality of Entgegensetzung that is essential to the dialectic is not in itself news, but restoring the idea of boundary formation and receptivity in idealism to the discourse of living functions and survival with which it was originally engaged performs an important task by allowing us to reunite in concrete ways, also in our debates, the subjective and the objective, the material and the intellectual. In dialogue with both Schelling and Brown, Novalis arrives at different formulations of identity, receptivity, and boundary. Or rather, to say he arrives is perhaps foolhardy. In his incredibly short period of productivity, Novalis seems to play with such constructions, which take on different forms in different places. In Blutenstaub, Novalis's first published work, we find the interrogation of boundaries centered in the language of interest, an idea that might elicit our interest also as a result of Goetz's article. Uh, uh, in, in Das Klein Gedruckte, which we read for today, and with which, in fact, it shares some interesting characteristics. This is Novalis. Interesse ist Teilnahme an dem Leiden und der Tätigkeit eines Wesens. Mich interessiert etwas, wenn es mich zur Teilnahme zu erregen weiß. Kein Interesse ist interessantester, interessanter, als was man an sich selbst nimmt. So wird der Grund einer merkwürdigen Freundschaft und Liebe, die Teilnahme ist, zu der mich ein Mensch reizt, der mit sich selbst beschäftigt ist, der mich durch seine Mitteilung gleichsam einladet, an seinem Geschäfte teilzunehmen. Interest involves a participation in the affairs, the affects, and the activity of another being. It is awakened by invitation, the form of which is here left open, but which involves communication, Mitteilung, and has an element of outreach, if not outright intent, the other must know how to, to excite such interest. The mechanism leaves the selfness of the other intact. It is their self-directed business in which one is invited to take part. And in this way, it also leaves one's own selfness intact in that one regulates the response to any such invitation through one's own deepest interest, namely in oneself. And yet the mitteilung or disclosure is also a form of co-splitting mitteilung in which pieces are taken, um, or perhaps taken up, Teilnahme, without being lost. Such a love or friendship is merkwürdig, noteworthy, a word that had not yet taken on uh, a reference to the condition of the strange, but remained an expression of the remarkable. Its reference to marking or noting 
uh, uh, causes the passage to point beyond the self um, and the inter-involved pair to the impact of the relationship on observers, the fact that such interest might inspire others to share in the excitement. The object of interest seems to be restricted to another living being, and yet the mitteilung that produces it is not restricted to immediate communication. It could be a book or an article. Gertz, for example, performs the self-regulatory aspects of this process in his skimming and discarding process, in which he seeks a fit between the properties of the text and his internal condition, we might say his property of excitability. The same external stimulus will not produce the same response in all people or in any given person at different times. In his unpublished Phys Physikalische Fragmente notebooks from 1798 to 1799, written while he was a student at the Mining Academy in Freiburg, Novalis goes beyond this notion of interest as participation, introducing forms of interactivity that demand a much greater flexibility in the idea of the individual. And um, this, this gets really wild, but we have to remember that uh, these were notebooks. Uh, they were not meant for publication. Um, Dario Nasser has a really nice reflection on uh, how to think about Novalis's notebooks um, in an article on the Fichte Studien. Um, but at, at any rate, these are fascinating thought experiments. While Schelling is particularly focused on the way that Brown and Rochlaub enable or force the drawing of boundaries between inside and out, Novalis is more interested here in the inextricability of the natural object, living or not, with its surroundings, indeed with its permeability and resulting state of flux. Wir nennen den Körper tot, der bloßen Leiter der Solicitation ist, den die Solicitation nicht weckt. Der absolute Nichtleiter der Solicitation ist wieder tot zu nennen. So sehen wir, dass das sensible Leben an sich ein Hauptzustand ist, worin wir die Körper unvollkommener Leiter der Solicitation nennen. Wir entdecken hier zugleich, dass Leben und Tod relative Begriffe sind. If health and illness were already relative for Brown, and I didn't go into Brown's theory of illness very much, but it uh, inheres in a, in a disproportion between the um, stimulus and the uh, a degree of excitability, right? So it's, there's a range that would still count as health, and exactly where illness would start is unclear. Um, but Novalis takes this concept to a new level. Life itself is an ambiguous circumstance in which the body receives a solicitation or call and conducts or transmits it, but only imperfectly neither reacting uh, merely according to physical laws nor failing entirely to interact with it. The word leiter or conductor reflects his merging of Brownian concepts with theories of electricity. But solicitation comes from a legal framework, as in the English word solicitor, or, for, or from a framework of anxiety and appeal, as in the English formulation solicitous. I'm not aware of German formulations with this, with this word. Um, associating life principally with the sensible, while not unique to Novalis, further emphasizes experiential sensitivity. The juxtaposition of conduction and solicitation strengthens the con connection between organic and inorganic implicit in the potential for bidirectional transmission of both. One might think that the ideal condition of the living body would be an attitude both receptive and responsive, positioned halfway between the two disquieting forms of death. And yet, in another formulation, Novalis posits a seemingly harder line of defense against the intrusion of the external that then slowly dissolves, claiming, Gesundheit ist Repulsionsfähigkeit gegen das Fremde. Das Gesunde ist ein Reizleiter. Das mehr als Gesunde ein Nichtleiter des, des Reizes. Leiter, Nichtleiter, weiblich, männlich. Sollte es in dieser Hin Hinsicht noch eine andere richtige, richtige Konstruktionsfigur geben? wo zum Beispiel Gesundheit als Repulsionskraft und Krankheit als Attraktionskraft in bestimmten Quantitäten zusammengepresst vorgestellt würden. Die eigentliche Gesundheit bestände dann bloß in der gleichbleibenden Verminderung beider und wäre nichts als das ursprüngliche Individualverhältnis, Konstitutionsverhältnis, der zusammengepressten Kräfte. Sollte die eine Intentionskraft die andere Extensionskraft sein, im Verhältnis, dass sich die eine schwächt, stärkt sich die andere. This torrent of shifting associations with health and sickness is interrupted by the self-conscious staging of helplessness in the face of linguistic inadequacy. Even in the previous quote, actually, he uses the word nennen at the end of every sentence. This is what we call this. This is what we call this. Um, uh, uh, he, he solicits here empathy for the difficulty of explaining indistinct phenomena. 
In this passage, health is a moving target, first identified as the ability to repulse the foreign, then as the attribute of conductivity for an external stimulus after all, but only when re-evaluated as inferior to something more than health, which would once again resist such conduction. And we'll actually return to the gender aspects here as well. When the connection between health and repulsion is reiterated, it is quickly subjected to yet another correction in which repulsive and attractive forces exist in a balance particular to a given individual. Its constitution, a word we, we will also return to. Finally, repulsion and attraction are tentatively reframed as intention in relation to extension, terms that allude both to occupying space and to interior will while sustaining the tension between them. Questions and subjunctives abound in this ricocheting volley as well as ambiguous phrases with the grammar of questions, although lacking its punctuation. What emerges from this apparent chaos is the idea of a flexible relationship to a spectrum of health and illness that privileges oscillation between a defensive and an open stance towards external influence, while simultaneously registering expansion or externalization into an outer world. In other words, this is not only a question uh, the, the, of receptivity. Receptivity also always implies um, the question of extension, right? Uh, because there would have to be both in order for any to register. The constitution of the individual is relational. The self, the subject, the individual is neither given nor fixed in opposition to an exterior, but rather emerges from an accrual or accretion of assertion that occurs beneath a border of perceptibility until it reaches an ich punkt, at which an ich height could be said to materialize. Those are Novalis' words. Novalis gives us a concrete exa example of how this interchange might work in a particular experience. Absolute light, Novalis claims, is never visible. Rather, a sense organ, an eye, responds to a stimulus of light through resistance to it. When the stimulus prevails, there is an experience of light. An equilibrium between stimulus and organ produces the more nuanced experience of day, already a human cultural phenomenon. When the eye, the sense organ, prevails, dusk or night is the experiential result, um, right? Because light is not registering as strongly. Lichtreiz und Auge sind hier vermischt und eins. The result of the amalgam of stimulus and sense organ belongs neither strictly to a perceiver nor to a world. It is instead a transmission in which both participate. Eating light, he uses the word frist, uh, the eye excretes visible things. Perception is like digestion, a process of extracting or even creating appropriate nourishment. As a result, Die sensible Wärme beim Brennen ist, so wie das sensible Licht beim Leuchten, nur ein Zeichen, dass die jetzt erzeugte doppelte Substanz Energie genug habe, um andere Körper zu erregen oder vulgar zu überwältigen und anzustecken. Experience can be characterized as nourishment and excretion, as a language of signs, as the production of offspring, right, he uses the word erzeugen, and also as contagion, which may be further transmitted by the perceiver in one or another form. Novalis's understanding of transmission as communication in both the sense of contagion and language radically opens the boundaries of bodies and minds, rendering them both flexible and vulnerable. If we bring this insight back to the, product, to the relationship between human beings, we might look to Novalis's definition of love that goes beyond the loving interest we started with and becomes absolute. In the Politische Aphorismen, Novalis reports, Alle Reize sind relativ, sind Größen, bis auf einen. Der ist absolut und mehr als Größe. Die vollkommenste Konstitution entsteht durch Inzitation und absolute Verbindung mit diesem Reize. Durch ihn kann sie alle übrige entbehren. Denn er wirkt anfänglich stärker im Verhältnis, dass die relative Reize abnehmen und umgekehrt. Hat er sie aber einmal ganz durchdrungen, so wird sie völlig indifferent gegen die relativen Reizen. Dieser Reiz ist absolute Liebe. So notice the word, way the word absolute comes up here, interestingly. Right? Absolute light, light is not perceivable. Absolute Liebe, on the other hand, saturates experience through absolute Verbindung. Absolute Verbindung. If the language of the Reiz and its attenuation gestures back towards Brown and Rochlaub, the idea of permeation or saturation of a concurrence of incitement with excitement is definitively Novalis's own. Such an intensification of interest would no longer leave the boundaries of the self and other intact. 
and would also ignore or block the new constitution created by the process to ongoing receptivity to new others. Its radical opening is therefore for also and simultaneously a radical closing, possibly not to others, um, uh, but certainly to other, uh, to other kinds of um, stimulus. It is this kind of love that Novalis identifies as the ideal form of relation of a state, both in the politische Aphorismen and by implication in Glaube and Liebe oder der König und die Königin. Remember that for Novalis, interest is regulated by the self in response to an open invitation. The relationship to, this, to the state must differ from this form of interest, since even in a republic, which is not something that Novalis was in favor of, it operates through the imposition of regulation backed up by force. It was this problem of state violence, but also of the ostensibly mechanical workings of, the govern of a governing state apparatus that Novalis hoped to solve with his, his theory of absolute, absolute love as a property of state relations. In Glaube und Liebe, he declares that ein wahrhaftes Königspaar ist für den ganzen Menschen, was eine Konstitution für den bloßen Verstand ist. This most perfect constitution of an integrated, affective intertwining stands in direct contrast to the paper constitution and its rights dictated by the understanding. The king is the head and the queen the heart. As a pair, they instantiate an aesthetic sovereignty through the queen's loving, beautiful communication of sovereign power held jointly. Novalis grants the queen jurisdiction over women's socialization, the care of small children, and the elderly. She has actual command in these areas. She is also a beacon for morals, but you can see how these duties melt into her aesthetic role borrowed from Edmund Burke. It is the queen's beauty and grace that veils the brute force of power for Burke, making subjecthood to a state tolerable for free men to assume. For Novalis, the violence is not merely veiled but dissolved by the merging of incitement and excitement. And I rehearsed this somewhat familiar moment in Novalis's work here because of its uncanny echo in the essay of Reinhold Goetz. Goetz describes for us a utopian instantiation of human relations. Fair care, and one could say that uh, fair care is not randomly chosen here, right? It means traffic, but it also means human relations. Um, so he, he has a vision of um, a sort of absolute realm of intuitive participation in this uh, fair care, regulated by within. Die Aufmerksamkeit füreinander, die viel komplizierter und situationsadäquater sein kann, als das klein gedrückte der verallgemeinernden Rechtsvorschriften. Even, even if we agree to leave aside the snide, the not entirely illegitimate response that such a sovereign and nuanced perspective over the whole should have enabled an awareness of the two police officers and thus allowed Goetz to avoid being caught running a red light through an intersection, it seems significant to dwell for just a few minutes on Goetz's small print. Goetz depicts two alternatives to the associative freedom he identifies with absolute idealism. And he does it, of course, uh, in his description of interest in reading material, but also in this, in this ride, uh, this, this um, cycling through uh, the city space. Um, so the first of these alternatives is the imposition of rules that belongs to a Reichstag. The second is the sorting of articles into a filing system subject to, subject to die Gewalttat der Raffenden zu Ordnung through which his own reason imposes order. Goetz uses the, second, uses the second in an act of revenge against the first. Indeed, he portrays the article itself as the staging of this act of revenge. Außerdem ist klar, dass sie, die Polizistinnen, um, es auch bei einer Ermahnung belassen könnten, aber sie sehen einen Menschen wie mich und haben keine Lust auf Nachsicht. Sie wird mich also bestrafen. Gut, die Prävention Wirkung Der Strafe kann ich akzeptieren, nicht hingegen die erzieherische Rede, die nervt. Die könnte ich nur annehmen, wenn sie mir dafür die Strafe erlassen würde, he reports. We should note here the subjunctive, which conveys Goetz's conviction that he has a choice, right? He has it within his power not to receive, annehmen, both the penalty and what he elsewhere calls an ausführliche Belehrung. Goetz carries, this out, carries out this, let's call it a threat, by subjecting the event to reclassification. He has a method of shifting from open associative interest to the necessity of organization. After reading articles and possibly leaving them exposed as springboards for thought for days or months, he files them away according to his own categories. Goetz describes this process of reifying the contingent as necessary. But relying on filing paper, paper articles is a choice that firmly rejects one of the most freeing aspects of the computer age, namely the ability to file non-violently in good conscience, namely by sifting articles into contingent orderings 
that do not exclude links to other categories and that allow any article to be found through the searching of even isolated words within them on a spontaneous whim. The offenses of the police officers, Gertz pillories in this article, consist primarily in first exercising educative power over Gertz. They force him to receive a lesson in which he has no self-motivated interest. Second, they refuse to mitigate or melt the blatant display of power through Nachsicht, understood by Novalis and Burke as the feminine element of the ideal state. And finally, Gertz blames the younger woman for his own false confession. His perception of her sympathetic smile as coercive, the fact that he feels affectively pressured by it, reveals his own complicity in a gender system for which he assigns her the blame. The confession in question is not an admission of the traffic violation, that is clear to all involved, but of the motive. Gertz agrees with the younger woman's suggested excuse that he was in a hurry. Obwohl ich überhaupt gar nicht in Eile gewesen war. Im Gegenteil, ich war ja einfach nur auf schönste, auf alle Fahrzeuge um mich herum aufmerksam orientiert, frei dahin geradelt. Um, I, you might note that there's a slight difference in the description here, right? Earlier he describes an Aufmerksamkeit für einander in the intersection, and here he, uh, he says that he's um, Aufmerksamkeit, Aufmerksam orientiert, uh, towards the other uh, vehicles, right? There's actually a slight shift. Um, so to be in a hurry, what would that mean? Namely, that one is implicated in a network of relations, of obligations, of duties, an awareness that one elicits the affect of others and that one experiences affect in response to their expected affect. How is this implication in human relations, in Verkehr, different from Goethe's description of his utopian state of mind as he approaches the intersection? his Aufmerksamkeit Führeinander. I would suggest that the difference is one of perspective. Pedaling freely towards the intersection, his interest is of the type first described by Novalis, in which self-interest dominates and no party is implicated in the business of the other. One stands outside, sovereign. Being in a hurry, however, presupposes that one has internalized the perspective of the other's expectation for oneself as one interprets it. We usually think about contemplation as the appropriate pose for receptivity, and I am both personally and professionally committed to the receptivity of the aesthetic. I am, after all, a literary critic. But to be truly receptive means to affect change. That change might be quiet, and it might not. In either case, it will find expression in action and behavior as well as in thought. Hurry could be seen as one of its effects. We are left to guess how Gertz has filed away these two policewomen, having gotten them down on paper and under his intellectual control. But in any case, he has demonstrated here the interdependence of the self-interested integration of material and intellect on the one hand with violence on the other. The organic state is always engaged in its own vivisection. If true receptivity is to be found in the orbit of absolute idealism, I would ask if we could uh, find a way to let go of opposition, of Entgegensetzung, as the only basis of boundary drawing, to move beyond duality to a multiplicitous understanding of differentials, which could allow for permeable boundaries that are not entirely self-regulated. This is where Carolina von Gunderoda offers at least a speculative avenue forward. In Die Manen, a fragment from her first book published in 1804, we find a dialogue between a student and a teacher about the workings of interest that runs quite differently than in Novalis. The student is distressed by the thought that Gustavus Adolphus, who has been dead for two centuries, is therefore lost to the present. The teacher responds, es ist nichts verloren, und in keiner Rücksicht. Nur unser Augen vermag die lange und ähnliche Kette von der Ursache zu allen Folgen nicht zu übersehen. Aber wenn du auch dieses nicht bedenken willst, so kannst du doch das nicht verloren und dahin nennen, was dich selbst so stark bewegt und so mächtig auf dich wirkt. Schon lange kenne ich dich und mich deucht, dein eigenes Schicksal und die Gegenwart habe dich kaum so heftig bewegt als das Andenken dieses großen Königs. Lebt er nicht jetzt noch in dir? For the student, evidently, breaking with Novalis's stipulation, interest in the other can exceed interest in the self. Interest, moreover, allows for a disturbance of temporality. While one chain of causes and effects proceeds from the actions of the living person forward after their death, reminders of that person, whether documents or monuments, the latter of which is implied here, can reintroduce causality spontaneously into the present at much later moments. This kind of interaction quickly blurs the lines between self and other according to a complex formulation that prevents their collapse into each other. Indeed, the other 
nur auf dasjenige wirken können, das Empfänglichkeit oder Sinn für sie. Oh, what happened? You're one ahead. I'm one ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, das Empfänglichkeit oder Sinn für sie hat. And I would note here the, the neuter form, which um, undermines gender and reaches beyond the human. This description, on the one hand, subjects the interesting elements of the other to a form of the self's regulation, its receptivity, thus preserving some persistent aspect of the self. And yet the teacher explicitly notes that perspectives and views change over time, transforming that to which one is receptive. Moreover, shared qualities not only link pairs of people, but all those who share it. And yet, alterity persists. What falls outside the receptivity of one interested party will be received by someone else. Indeed, the conversation itself appears to have changed both participants and possibly also its readers, thus altering the intellectual relations of multitudes to which each is connected. While Dimanen focuses on the interpersonal, even if writ large, Gunderoda's philosophical epistolary uh, essay, Briefe zwei Freunde, links the intellectual to the material while following a similar principle of the harmony between related elements. And I am approaching the end here. Here, the unnamed interlocutor explains that life participates in the transformations of the earth by changing its elements. Ebenso über allem Zweifel ist mir die Unsterblichkeit des Lebens in Gan im Ganzen, denn dieses Ganze ist eben das Leben und es wogt auf und nieder in seinen Gliedern den Elementen. Und was es auch sei, dass durch Auflösung, die wir zuweilen Tod nennen, zu denselben zurückgegangen ist, das vermischt sich mit ihnen nach Gesetzen der Verwandtschaft, das heißt, das Ähnliche zu dem Ähnlichen. Aber anders sind diese Elemente geworden, nachdem sie einmal im Organismus zum Leben hinaufgetrieben gewesen. The cycle laid out here integrates enhanced elements from previous lives into new manifestations of life according to the way that life was lived. Gunderoda is not the first to suggest something like the recycling of organic elements. Diderot did so in D'Alembert's Dream, published anonymously in 1782, and Lawrence Aukin described a similar process in his 1805 work on generation, which um, Gunderoda may or may not have um, seen before working on this. Only in Gunderoda's formulation, however, is there a unity between the material elements and the intellect of the particular living beings in which those elements participate. The process has undeniable teleological tendencies, manifested in an ideal future realization of what the interlocutor refers to as the Idee der Erde. Humans are but one integral component of a universal, self-directed, organiz organizational process propelled by granular activity and engaged, the letter writer proposes, in the Earth's own striving. Unlike Novalis's claim in Blutenstaub, zur Bildung der Erde sind wir berufen, however, here, Morals are that which align human activity with the Earth's process of universalizing transformation. Es ist mir nun auch deutlich geworden, was die großen Gedanken von Wahrheit, Gerechtigkeit, Tugend, Liebe und Schönheit wollen, die auf dem Boden der Persönlichkeit keimen und ihn bald überwachsend sich hinaufziehen nach dem freien Himmel, ein unsterbliches Gewächs, das nicht untergeht mit dem Boden, auf dem es sich entwickelte, sondern immer neu sich erzeugt im neuen Individuum. Denn es ist das Bleibende, Ewige, das Individuum aber, das zerbrechliche Gefäß. The virtues, as Gunderoda defines them, and she does define many individually, transcend the transitory individual, each in a, way, each in a different way manifest, manifests a shift in behavior and perspective away from self-interested isolation and towards the universal. The ethical state is described as approaching conditions of both Gleichgewicht and harmonischen Sein. Each such personal transformation transforms the earth itself and thereby helps nature achieve its idea. Nature is neither an instructor nor a suppliant for human improving activity. Rather, virtue is a name for a particular kind of natural striving that rests, however, on human spontaneity. The speaker gestures here towards a kind of absolute, suggesting that the universal idea towards which the earth tends proceeds by dissolving multiplicity into unity by combining intellect with material, such a unity, however, if complete, would ultimately destroy the difference that is a precondition for both harmony and equilibrium, which are the words she uses to describe the ideal. However, the speaker themselves is both hesitant in their claims about this smoothing of difference and deeply ambivalent about the loss of interpersonal relations that the loss of individuality would entail. We are left then with two distinct versions in tension with each other, 
one that maintains particular bonds and another that that dissolves them. The difference between the two is not smoothed over in the text, but stands as an effective uncertainty, a split in perspectives that performatively constitutes at the level of the real, the disharmony it tentatively posits at the level of the ideal. This is the last quote. Ob es der Erde gelingen wird, sich so unsterblich zu organisieren, weiß ich nicht. Es kann in ihren Ohrelementen ein Missverhältnis von Wesen und Form sein, das sie immer daran hindert. Und vielleicht gehört die Totalität unseres Sonnensystems dazu, um dieses Gleichgewicht zustande zu bringen. Vielleicht reicht dieses wiederum nicht zu und es ist eine Aufgabe für das gesamte Universum. If at the microcosmic level, the individual is a fragile vessel, the constitution of the world itself is also marked by a potential flaw in its relationality. Such a disproportion between es essence and form echoes the disproportion between stimulus and excitability or life principle that for Brown and Rorschlaub is the source of illness. The flaw here, however, or even just the potential for it, holds a secret gift. Refusing any kind of totalizing gesture, an absolute fundamentally awry, provides enough room for alterity to allow for entanglement and co connection, for transmission and for receptivity, from teacher to student, from student to teacher, from friend to friend, and from generation to generation. Thank you so much for this uh, very, very rich contribution. Uh, and uh, I think you really got a point because if uh, we want to address the absolute idealism of reception, uh, we should address life. Uh, we, we, co we can, we can co uh, call it absolute idealism of life, actually, because the only way we have to distinguish uh, a dead body from a living body is sensation. Mm -hmm. That is what Aristotle says. That is also what Novalis said in the, uh, the quotation you, you, you made. Um, and life, okay, what is life? Uh, I think I like a lot the, the quotation, uh, I think also by Novalis, uh, about the, rep the repulsion Feigheit. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it reminded me what Hegel said, uh, says about life in a more uh, ripe uh, analysis of, of what life is. In the science of logic, it says that life is uh, infinite self-referring negativity. Mm -hmm. So uh, life is a negation, is a negation of, uh, of the influences of the external world. So my, my, qu my first question is, uh, um, actually, if you think that uh, somehow Hegel with this uh, quotation, with his reflection about life, uh, somehow evolves uh, the uh, previous reflections about uh, about life that we have in the romantic uh, thinkers and so on. And um, about the second question is um, more about sensation. And uh, um, actually, um, if you think that... Um, um, the, if you think that life is really infinity and is an infinity way of uh, of exploring exploring the world by perceiving it and uh, we are aesthetic beings so uh, as as a human beings we are, we are aesthetic beings and we really uh, evolve art evolve way of exploring uh, sensation, exploring uh, our uh, uh, sensibility. And uh, do you think really that uh, somehow uh, the possibility of uh, um, perceived reality are infinite? And that uh, in making art, we are broadening our possibility of perceiving the world and also the possibility of improving ourselves as a, as a species. Okay, that was a, a very uh, a very rich question. Um, I would say in answer to the first one, yeah, I mean, Hegel is definitely uh, uh, part of this uh, discussion, right? Part of this dialogue and um, moving in uh, a different direction. But the idea of 
um, uh, life as negation uh, does develop to some extent out of, right, I mean, Schelling's idea of uh, the Entgegensetzung, which is also to some extent related to Rorschach, not that, not that uh, anyone was fully inheriting it from anybody. Um, do I think that life is infinite? I, I do think that life is, uh, you know, extremely uh, varied, right? Um, life is uh, an abstract term, um, which many of the romantics use, um, begin to use, right? Um, that itself would have to take on a definition before one could really think about whether it's it's infinite. What, what I would say is, I mean, what seems interesting to me about this group of thinkers looked at together is the way in which um, they're, so I would say particularly Novalis is striving for some form of flexible receptivity, but he's still very much involved in um, a dualistic view of how that could work and what it would involve, right? There's there's only the Leiter and the Nicht Leiter, um, the Solicitation and the Nicht Solicitation, right? There's there's a response or a not, there's a, there's a range between those two, but there isn't a third or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth option. Um, and uh, thinking about the ways in which um, difference is differential might help uh, uh, envision forms of receptivity that are less threatening to, but also more open to uh, uh, constellations or constitutions of um, personalities. Um, thanks very much. I had a question about the structure of the talk. And it, it, it seemed to me that such a central slide was this Novalis distinction between das Gesunde ist ein Reizleiter, das mehr als Gesunde ist ein Nicht-Reizleiter, um, which I, I took to be sort of a central a turning point or a crux of what you're after. And I guess I had two questions or observations I'm trying to, to understand. It's a fascinating phrase and, and what exactly it, it means. And the first is that in the first half of your of your presentation, I was struck once again by the affinities between, let's say something like systems theory and this um, notion of perception here, that it looks like we have something like a system environment distinction, and that we have some notion of what in that Luhmannian vocabulary would be irritierbarkeit, is actually mm -hmm. how do systems get the adequate amount. And I guess the first question is, is that what Novalis is after there in terms of some sort of branch between Reitzleiter and nicht Reitzleiter, that one has to be in some way able to not fully be, I don't know, molded or shaped by, by the environment, that that's what it means to be a non, um, a non transmitter. So the first question is about what's going on there sort of epistemologically, if it means an ability to, to sort of shut oneself off from the outside. The second is that he immediately maps it onto a gender context, which then becomes very important. But what's striking is that, at least if I've understood how you set this up right, so we have Reizbarkeit or Reizleiter, which is feminine, and nicht Reizbarkeit, which is masculine. But the notion of love in the very next slide is you are susceptible to something that then makes you entirely unsusceptible. It's almost like a, is that a dialectical dissolution of the gender or one has to be feminine to become truly masculine? or? So I guess those are the two questions. What's happening epistemologically with that one Novalis quote? And what's happening in terms of how that gets mapped onto gender relations for the rest of your talk? Maybe that's too abstract a question, yeah, but no, no. it seems so central. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, those are two very good questions. Um, I, I do think, indeed, that uh, uh, there's something um, similar going on here with, with uh, systems theory, right? That, that, that the, the issue is, indeed, how does one both um, be, be, a, be alive, or we could put this into less biological terms and also say be intellectually uh, a thinking being, right, um, uh, without... Um, th who accepts influences without being taken over by them, right? Um, so uh, particularly given that he, he thinks of this almost as an Ansteckbarkeit, right? You can be, it's, it's contagious. How does one maintain any sort of um, 
spontaneity, uh, any sort of will, any any core of uh, one's own interest having an influence on one's future uh, deliberations, right? And so, yeah, I think that this is what's going on in the in the uh, Reitzleiter and nicht Reitzleiter. Uh, and the solicitation, right, all of these terms that he keeps coming up with, one after the other. Um, I think that for Novalis, as for Schlegel and for uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, right, masculinity and femininity were not isolated to men and women, respectively, right, that there were um, masculine and feminine elements of individuals. And so um, he doesn't mean only women are Reitzleiter and, and men aren't, but rather that there's some... Um, there's some constitutional balance of these things uh, in individuals, um, but of course he does map them onto genders that also agree at, that also exist as sexes in, in his world, right? So um, one presumes that there is some relationship between the uh, the the way that he assigns the terms and his concepts of who is likely to be more or less receptive, who is likely to have m more. Selbsthalt or some, something, right? More, more kind of ability to to assert their own uh, inner core, um, and who will be more influenced. Ja, vielen Dank. Das ist jetzt tatsächlich auch nur so eine Art Fußnote zu der letzten Frage, weil ich mich auch gefragt habe, wie das mit der Irritabilität in der äh, Systemtheorie ist. Es scheint mir tatsächlich sozusagen, dass ja diese, wenn ich das richtig in Erinnerung habe, auch das Konzept der, der strukturellen Kopplung. Also sozusagen die Systeme sind an einer bestimmten Stelle irritabel, das ist aber eine Eigenschaft des Systems und da kann dann ein Anstoß von außen erfolgen gewissermaßen und dann aber zu internen Verarbeitungen führen. Aber es ist die einzige Möglichkeit. Ich habe mich gefragt, weil Götz ist ja auch Lumanianer. Also ich meine, also er ist natürlich Hegelmarxist, aber dann war er zwischenzeitlich, das kann man vergessen haben, in der Zwischenzeit hat er sich ganz häufig und ganz intensiv auf Luhmann bezogen. Es gibt auch irgend so ein Material, Band aus den 90ern, so eine Karikatur, wo man, das ist eindeutig Luhmann und drunter steht Hegel 1927. Ähm, und jetzt habe ich mich gefragt, ob das irgendwie, ob du das nochmal, ob das, ob das zu, dem, zu deiner Götz-Lektüre. Und da wollte ich auch nochmal fragen, tatsächlich, ich habe das nicht ganz verstanden, wie das, welche Rolle das spielt, dass das zwei Polizistinnen sind. Das heißt, es sind tatsächlich zwei Frauen an der Stelle. Also ja, ich ja. schreibe das nicht mit Gendersternchen, sondern als Polizistin nee, sind nee, tatsächlich nee, zwei nee, Frauen. Das heißt, ja, ja. Und äh, es gibt ja schon, ich habe jetzt beim Durchblättern bei Götz auch nochmal es gibt ja schon diese massiv misogyn, misogynen Stellen bei ihm. Also es ist schon da, auch ein bisschen komisch, wenn man das heute liest irgendwie. Vielleicht auch, weil es einem damals nicht so aufgefallen ist. Ähm, und äh, das würde ich mich noch mal interessieren. Wie das, was, was für eine Rolle das spielt. Ja. Yeah. So, I mean, the truth is, I, I, I wonder to what extent this, um, these sort of theories of uh, regulation, excitability, um, uh, boundary crossing, uh, self assertion are, are actually really a, a chain of causes and effects that we don't trace because it's been a century, <laughs> right? I mean, I think um, they, they are they're everywhere once you start um, looking for them. I mean, I think Freud's uh, Jens Leitz's Prinzips is a, is a good example of, of someone who seems very much um, in, in, uh, um, permeated by th this kind of thinking, um, so to speak. Um, uh, I don't know what to say about um, Goethe's own uh, connection to, to systems theory in this um, in this regard. Uh, I have to admit, I, I was I recognize that I'm taking to some extent pot shots, right? Because I'm I'm just looking at one article, and so it's clearly a, a kind of partial um, uh, analysis. Nonetheless, um, it seemed to me to be his own language, right? That he why stage the article in this way? Why frame it through the uh, traffic ticket given by two police women? On the one hand, the the um, sort of uh, there isn't a good translation in English for Reichstadt, and uh, on the other hand, his own study in which he's doing something similar with um, his reason, but somewhat reluctantly. But after all, it's necessary, right? And um, um, I mean, I think he I think he actually sets up the article uh, in this way to have one um, to have the activity of writing and turning the incident into an article be uh, his response to the to the occurrence that allows it to come under his control again, right? He puts it on paper. He puts it on paper, and then he can stick it in his filing cabinet. Um, uh, the fact that they are, just happen to be two uh, policewomen, I mean, I, I, look, we all get annoyed when we get, when we get tickets. Um, he may indeed not have been done any, doing anything that was um, unsafe, but his reaction is um, suffused with gender language. Uh, the, the the fact that he um, 
he first blames the older one and he always tells you which this is the older one this is the younger one the older woman is giving him a lecture right so she's instantiating this kind of um blatant power the younger one is smiling at him and the smile drives him nuts because he reacts to it um uh he sees it as a sympathetic smile and it elicits from him um a, a, a statement that he doesn't actually believe in Right, so so there, there there is clearly something going on with the with the gender of the police officers. Yeah, thanks so much. I also have a question on the on on Goetz and and Novalis. So, um, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I find this. Uh, this a uh, super interesting. Uh, it's not only incidentally there, but this is a very interesting, um, very interesting quotation there. I was just wondering, in a certain sense, whether you would think that there is a point of contact here still between Goetz and Novalis, in a certain sense, so that you would assume there's something like this, absolute Liebe, because it strikes me, and this is very much systems theory going on, um, that that. Uh, Although he's articulating something, or God is onto something uh, that can be expressed as an absolute idealism of reception, he very much traces the way in which it is brought about as as one that can never cross the boundary, cannot can never dissolve the eye into some kind of holistic yeah. becoming a part. I mean, there is this. Uh, there's also this interesting uh, second text on on social energy where he talks about what happens when we then come together uh, as a community and, and celebrate a text. And there is this element uh, of celebration and of overcoming oneself. But over overcoming oneself is only something that can be done by an intensive work on, of an individual subject. So I'm not sure whether we need to read this absolute love in, in such a manner that it makes us indifferent in a certain sense and blend into one another. Uh, but um, I, would, I would kind of, just mm. in terms of the sensibility, I mean, mm -hmm. definitely with the pop literature in general, but also Goetz specifically, there's a there is a, an affinity with the romantics. But this kind of blend or, or becoming part of the soul in this indifferentiated way, I would it would strike me as not Goetzian. I yeah. don't know if that's a term you could use, but no, no, I agree with you. Um, and uh, you're right to point out uh, the tension here because I I read indeed this um, one description that he has. He you know, really only has one description. Not with, so he has a deeper uh, descriptions when he talks about his process of reading. But when he talks about his process of sort of being out of and about in the world, he only has this one very brief sentence where he talks about this kind of ideal um, Aufmerksamkeit für einander at the in the intersection. And I do in fact read that as one in which he is still very much. Um, uh, the sovereign perspective um, that uh, for which Aufmerksamkeit Führer is not a, a, a kind of Verbindende, right? It's it's something that um, uh, um, is 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 a kind of look at something rather than a look around from the inside of something. Um, and I sort of I, I do indeed sort of gloss over that in the in the paper. Um, I think that there uh, is still a way in which he's trying to oppose some form of alternate um, um, social coexistence to a Reichstadt, right? And the question is, what would that be and how would it be regulated and how would it be, be managed? And, you know, Novalis wants to do that through love. I, I wouldn't suppose that Gertz wants to do that through love. <laughs> but, but there is... Um, he doesn't actually tell us, you know, what the whether there would be um, whether one could rely, in his view, on everybody remaining safe in an intersection. <laughs> I I sound like such a, a bourgeois defendant of police tickets at the moment, but um, I do. Uh, I you, you know he also comes across another police scene um, in the in the article where an accident has in fact happened and the police are investigating how it might have happened, um, he, he finds that work much more interesting, right? The, the idea of um, untangling the set of sort of circumstances and causes. Uh, and, you know, it just, it, it, it does seem that there needs to be uh, some sort of, of um, communication between those two scenes and what it would mean 
to uh, depend on a receptivity without without law. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, everyone, please join me in thanking so much for oh. being here. Oh, sorry, not yet. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to give this hand over to you. Thank you. At some point in your presentation, okay, I thought it was loud enough. Um, so I had an impression that at some point in your presentation you seem to be approaching um, Novalis um, as a naturalist or maybe Schelling also as a naturalist. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, um, especially this citation, um, he talks about uh, relative, so, um, so alle Reize sind relative, sind grüßen, uh, and then until one happens that it's actually not uh, measurable, right? Die vollkommenste Konstitution entsteht durch Initiation und absolute Verbindung mit diesem Reize. Durch ihn kann sie alle übrigen entbehren. Und dann wird anfänglich stärker im Verhältnis, die, dass die relative Reize abnehmen. So what will be the distinction here between the relative um, uh, excitability rights uh, and then the absolute? I mean, would you be able to explain that in naturalist terms? I mean, what is he talking about? It's not measurable. So, I mean, so the, the rights is just a word for stimulation. Stimulation, yeah. Um, and uh, um, anything that uh, is sensed by a body would be a rights. And here he's simply said, he's stipulated that um, all of them are relative in the sense that they stand in relation to each other in a variety of strengths or weaknesses, right? Um, they could be measured against each other, not that there's a, necessarily a, a, uh, a standard measurement. Interestingly, people often accused Brown of having tried to come up with such a standard measurement. There was um, an edition of his works that had a list of, a numerical list that tried to um, formulate what, how strong various, various um, forms of excitement would be. But here, I think the, the point is just that there, uh, that from Novalis's perspective, they're relative to each other except for love, which he sees as um, being absolute in the sense that it goes beyond all forms of, of measure and uh, overwhelms the um, other, any other um, influences that one could feel, right? So is this a naturalist perspective? I mean, I think that um, Novalis is, uh, he's absolutely engaging with and reading um, I mean, he, he's, he's reading Brown and Rochelab. He's, he's reading um, botanists. He's reading, I mean, he reads all sorts of naturalist works um, uh, as well as philosophy. But I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how strict the, I mean, Sch Schelling is also reading these things. Um, uh, Novalis is obviously m more than Schelling actually involved in uh, what one could call scientific work um, as, a, as a mining engineer. Uh, not sure that that really has a direct influence here. So I'm, I guess I'm, uh, I'm not sure what what um, what the stakes are for calling this a naturalist response. Um, I mean, how fits into this philosophical project of Novalis? And obviously, Schelling is also reading um, a lot of um, 18th century uh, biology, but I wouldn't call his term of real philosophy uh, a sort of natu naturalist approach to nature. No, I, I, yeah, I think that's true of Novalis as well, right? Yeah, he's, he's, um, he, he's not trying to describe nature. He's trying to figure out what the principles are by which some, some description of nature could affect the way we think about how we think. Yeah, um, thank you a lot for um, for your talk. Um, I have a question about the um, about the relation between activity and passivity in the quote of um, of um, friendship and love. So this Interesse ist Teilnahme an dem Leiden und der Tätigkeit eines Wesens. Because it seemed to me that there is an interesting paradox. Because what uh, what is interesting me or what is attaching me to the other is the indifference of the other towards me. Now, when I want to um, attach the, the other to myself, uh, I have to give up my interest because the other would only be interested in myself when I'm not being interested towards the other. Uh, so it seemed to me that in order, I mean, he's talking about the basis of friendship and love, so that 
either there can never be a, a symmetric relation because I always have to give up my attachment to the other in order to attach the other to myself, or there is a way of realizing uh, this paradox uh, that I'm at the same time, in a way, um, um, at attaching to the other because he's uh, not interested in myself, he's indifferent to me, and at the same time, I'm giving up this interest towards the indifference of the other. And how could this, uh, uh, what, what could be the form? And maybe, um, like, second question, is this in any way maybe related to the notion of life, like you've presented as this double of um, reception and, and resistance. So is, is there a connection to this or not? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. That's actually a great um, uh, sort of detailed reading of the phrase, der, der mit sich selbst beschäftigt ist, right? Yeah. That, that, in other words, the one who, from whom the invitation originates, right? There is some interest because there's been some form of an invitation. But um, but that uh, individual, that, that person is still uh, really self-involved. Um, what I would say is that given that one's own, one's interest in oneself is declared to be the strongest interest, it's not clear to me that the, um, let's call it the one rather than the other, right? That the one who is interested here um, uh, has given up that self-interest. I think rather that something in the invitation has made the, uh, some element of the other's activity or the other's personality um, connected to the to the interest of the self, right? Because that's that's remains defined as the deepest interest. Um, so I believe you're. I, I I would agree with you that there has to be some kind of a um, uh, there, there's a difference. There's a non matching in the way in which the two would relate to each other. But that non-matching would not necessarily mean that it wasn't reciprocal. In other words, the other could reciprocate exactly this formation, it seems to me. And each would be interested in the other and going about their own business while being interested in the business of the other as well. They just would retain, it would be like a series of involutions in which, um, uh, in which those, those, the accounts of whose interest and whose uh, uh, business is whose it doesn't actually mi mix the way it does later in the absolute love. All right, is that another one? Now, now you can speak. Uh <laughs>